for the majority of the history of the galaxy. The stories of pitched battles between light and dark, good and evil, Jedi versus Sith have dominated the history books. But there exists a third party, with intentions known to a few, and loyalties only to their own ranks. This is the story of the Mandalorian clans. Clan Visla is with you. Clan Rook is with you. Clan Elder is with you. Clan Kreese is with you. The Protectors are with you. Firstly, before we get into any of the histories of the Mandalorian people, it is important to understand how the Mandalorian peoples were organized. The Mandalorians were not a race, but rather a creed. While there were a Mandalorian people hailing from the planet of Mandalore, Mandalorians could be part of any race or species spread throughout the Star Wars galaxy, and they were organized in various hierarchical systems with different levels of leadership. Obviously, first we have the individual Mandalorian, which could be a Crusader, a Neo-Crusader, or any other form of Mandalorian warrior that was spread out amongst various different classes. The clan was the first level of organization amongst the Mandalorian peoples. Clans had loyalty to themselves primarily above any of the other clans in the Mandalorian Creed. Noteworthy clans include Clan Wren and Clan Ordo. Clans that all hailed from one specific family would form what is known as a house. A notable house in the Star Wars galaxy is House Vizsla. Houses that are a part of House Vizsla include Clan Krees, Clan Wren, Clan Saxon, and of course, Clan Vizsla as the leading clan of the house. Mandalorian clans were united under a house, and it was thought, similar to how feudal Europe worked, that whenever a house leader required aid, they would call upon the subsequent clans in their family household to ally under his banner. This is similar to what Death Watch did in Star Wars The Clone Wars. Death Watch was House Vizsla. So that means that Clan Wren, Clan Krees, Clan Vizsla, and Clan Saxon all pledged their loyalty to Pre Vizsla, the leader of House Vizsla. Houses were mostly separate from one another. Apart from the house system, there was also the Protectors, which recruited the most lethal warriors from all of the houses to join their ranks. You will recognize these from Star Wars Rebels. Apart from the clans and the houses, there was only one position which managed to unify all of the houses into one solid group. This position, the leader of these peoples, would be known as the Mandalore, taking its name from the planet which the Mandalorians find their origin. The Mandalore was decided upon who could beat the best and previous warrior using the Darksaber. Now, the Darksaber was lost for a period of several hundred to even thousands of years in the fall of the Old Republic, where it was eventually retrieved. So, in between the period of the construction of the Darksaber and its retrieval from the Jedi Temple, the Mandalore was decided upon the Mask. The Mask of the Mandalore would be what was passed down, and this is precisely why... Mandalorians were so disunified after the Jedi Mandalorian Wars. But we'll get into the history of that later. Tar Vizsla, the first Mandalorian ever inducted into the Jedi Order. After his passing, the Jedi kept the Saber in their temple. The story of the Mandalorians begins with Tar Vizsla, who at a young age was inducted into the Jedi Order, becoming the first and only known Mandalorian Jedi. While a part of the Order, he created the legendary Darksaber, a unique black lightsaber with a white glow to it. He would use this weapon in the later years of his life to unite the clans of Mandalore, uniting them under his leadership. Upon Tar Vizsla's death, his weapon was seized by the Jedi Order and taken to the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. As years passed, the supposed neutrality of the Mandalorian clans waned as war began to dawn upon the galaxy between the Republic and the Mandalorians. While the Mandalorians had certain secluded conflicts with the Galactic Republic, few large-scale engagements ever existed. However, in 3978 BBY, Mandalore the Ultimate was approached by a secret Sith agent and taken to a sacred location of the Sith species. Herein, he was disclosed of a certain prophecy and vision that the Sith had been gifted, where the Mandalorian clans washed across the galaxy and destroyed all in their path, conquering the Republic and subjugating the galaxy under their rule. With the inspiration of this false message, Mandalore had been tricked and had been goaded into conflict with the Galactic Republic. 
Initially beginning on the eastern edge of the galaxy, Mandalore crusaded against multiple planets, bringing us to many well-known planets from the Knights of the Old Republic, like Onderon and Terrace. Eventually, the Mandalorians decided that they needed to push into the core of the galaxy. Using three seldom-used hyperspace lanes directly to the core, the Mandalorians used a move that was later known as the Onslaught. The Republic military, which was a skeleton force at the time, was ill-equipped to handle the Mandalorian Crusaders. That was until a brilliant tactician managed to join the ranks of the Republic army, going against the Jedi Code and bringing many of his followers with him. This Jedi was named Revan, and he and his friend Malak pushed hard against the Mandalorian onslaught. The Jedi and the Republic were ultimately successful at the climax of the war on Malachor V, which featured the destruction of both the Republic Army and the Mandalorian Army, ending the war in the Jedi's favor. The Republic forced the Mandalorian clans to disarm and disband, going off into their various nomadic tribes. And despite this, the Mandalorians did not hold resentment towards the Jedi Knights, specifically Revan. They actually admired the man as being a brilliant tactician and skillful warrior as it was a part of the Mandalorian creed to be a strong warrior. Much like the Vikings in our timeline, death in battle was the greatest honor a Mandalorian could have, and thus they were not disappointed with their defeat at the hands of Revan and the Republic, rather thrilled that they managed to actually have a matched conflict with an adversary equal in strength. The end of the Mandalorian Wars was something new and unknown to us. Revan fought us like a true warrior and defeated us on our own terms. Revan embodied our philosophy and showed us our own weaknesses. Then he exploited them. You Mandalorians just got what you deserved at Malachor. Defeat is part of a warrior's life. We will recover, stronger than before. What followed were several hundred years of supposed peace. While Mandalorians tried to unite as they would, they ultimately failed in successfully reuniting the Mandalorian creed, though as the Sith encroached again onto Republic lands in the Second Jedi-Sith War, Mandalorians, despite their supposed treachery in the beginning of the First Mandalorian War, joined forces with the Sith Lord Darth Malgus in his initial sacking of the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. During this raid, the Darksaber was retrieved by a descendant of Tar Vizsla. It is with this weapon that the clans would be reunited once again, though this did not happen for a long time afterwards. The Republic was ultimately successful in beating the Sith Mandalorian dual force. However, this led to the glassing of the planet Mandalore, making it a desolate and lifeless place. Of the thousands of years in between this and our next period, little is known about the Mandalorians other than they were used as mercenaries and bounty hunters by various interested groups and whoever could pay the highest bid. The Mandalorians, however, were not unified under the Darksaber at this moment, but it was passed down along the Vizsla line. This is my father, Jango Fett. Yes. He even fought in the Mandalorian Civil Wars. I appreciate its return. Eventually, by relative terms very close to the beginning of the Skywalker saga, a young foundling, Jango Fett, was found by Jaster Mareel and adopted into the Mandalorian Creed. Jaster would mentor the young Fett and eventually train him in the Mandalorian ways, where he would eventually fight in the Mandalorian Civil War. The Mandalorian Civil War was a split between the Mandalorian creeds, those following the true way of the Mandalorian, and those abiding by the philosophies of the terrorist group known as Death Watch. Tor Vizsla, a descendant of Tar Vizsla, the creator of the Darksaber, was the leader of the Death Watch clan, and managed to convince the Jedi to attack the group of true Mandalorians, killing all but Fett, including his mentor Jaster Mareel. Fett eventually did track down Tor Vizsla and kill him. This concluded the first Mandalorian Civil War, though the Death Watch was technically victorious in this sense. Following the Civil War, Duchess Satine Kreese of Mandalore outlawed the old ways of the Mandalore, vying for pacifism in the galactic scene and excommunicating and expelling all members of the Mandalorian warrior creed to nearby moons, while most 
actually disbanded and went off to other parts of the galaxy, like the Concord Dawn with the Protectors and various other planets. The Death Watch remained in the system, performing terrorist attacks on multiple Mandalorian targets. Jango Fett was not present in this second civil war, but he did go on to become a bounty hunter, eventually being contacted by Darth Tyrannus of the Sith to be a template for a clone army of the Republic. You want to clone me? Imagine an army of clones, the training of which you will oversee. They will be modified to grow at twice the rate of ordinary men and will be programmed for absolute loyalty. They will be magnificent, perfect warriors like you. What makes you think I'd be interested? A chance at immortality to pass on your ways to an army crafted in your image. Fett would travel to Kamino, where he would then be used as a genetic template for the clone armies of the Republic, staying behind and training many of them, including ARC troopers as well as clone commandos and certain other specific branches of the army, though most of the training was left to the Kaminoans. I'm just a simple man trying to make my way in the universe. Ever made your way as far into the interior as Coruscant? Once or twice. At the outbreak of the Clone Wars on Geonosis, Jango Fett unfortunately met his end while allying himself with Count Dooku, also known as Darth Tyrannus. Mace Windu decapitated him in the arena pits on Geonosis, while Boba Fett, a genetic template and clone of the previous Jango Fett and Jango Fett's own foundling, watched in horror. The specific alliances that Boba Fett had with the Mandalorian Creed are loose at best. He wore the armor like a Mandalorian, and in many ways embodied the warrior spirit of a Mandalorian, but never abided by the Creed, as was very common in someone like Jango Fett. While he followed his father's footsteps in becoming a bounty hunter and one of the best in all of the galaxy, Boba Fett, while technically could be considered a Mandalorian, and certainly is according to canon, didn't exactly follow the Creed as well as close as someone like Jango Fett. As the Clone Wars raged on, the Mandalorians again were contacted by the Sith, this time again by Darth Tyrannus, contacting Pre Vizsla of the Mandalorian group known as Death Watch. Death Watch was to perform terrorist attacks inside the capital city of Mandalore. When Duchess Satine, who had expelled the previous warriors of Mandalore from Mandalore, contacted Obi-Wan Kenobi, an old Jedi friend, Pre Vizsla revealed himself to be the leaders of the Death Watch. Pre Vizsla then revealed that he was in possession of the Darksaber, an ancient weapon that, as he said, thousands of Jedi died by its blade. Prepare yourself to join them. While the Duchess was able to escape, the Mandalorians did mobilize. However, Count Dooku ordered that they were not to attack the capital of Mandalore, when Pre Vizsla insisted that he would be able to capture the capital easily with his warriors, Dooku would say that they would be only be able to hold it for a day or two before he would send forces to mobilize against them. To teach Pre Vizsla of his arrogant ways, Count Dooku gave him a slash across the face, a scar which he would bear for the rest of his life. Sometime following the falling out, between Count Dooku and Pre Vizsla, a sect of the Death Watch split off from its terrorist cell, becoming the Children of the Watch, a group of Mandalorians which followed the ancient ways of not removing one's armor or helmet within the presence of others. During a Separatist attack on an unknown village, the foundling Din Djarin was rescued by members of Children of the Watch, still sporting their blue Death Watch armor. The Children of the Watch are known throughout the Mandalorian Creed as a zealous religious cult, hell-bent on bringing back the old ways of Mandalore. This can likely be linked to the old Mandalore being the leader of the Mandalorian Creed, having not removed his helmet ever, since his very identity was the Mandalorian Creed. This being expanded on to the entire sect of the Mandalorians, meaning that the entire population of the Children of the Watch would not remove their armor or helmet for the remainder of their life as long as they had put it on in the first place. Moving back to Death Watch, many people tried to contact the Death Watch to actually assassinate Count Dooku, including Lux Bonteri. However, this eventually ended up in their camp being foiled. 
Lux Bonteri escaped with the help of Jedi Padawan Ahsoka Tano. Years later, a gauntlet fighter would soon come across an old Sith Lord, Darth Maul, and Pre Vizsla would take them back to his camp, where he would heal him and his brother Savage Opress. Darth Maul promised that he could help them reclaim Mandalore, kill the Sith pretender Dooku, and bring all their enemies to their knees. Their plan was relatively simple. Attack key points with members of various other cartels, including the Black Sun, the Hutt Cartel, and the Pike Syndicate, attacking various targets on Mandalore's capital city. Then, members of the Death Watch would come in and act as the saviors of the city, arresting or killing these supposed deposers. The plan was a rousing success. However, Pre Vizsla betrayed Darth Maul and Savage Opress, throwing them in prison. However, the two escaped and eventually enlisted the help of Prime Minister Olmec, who had been thrown in prison for corruption and buying of black market goods. Darth Maul was then informed by Olmec that should Darth Maul challenge Pre Vizsla, he would be honor bound to fight him in a trial by combat, the winner claiming the Darksaber and being given leadership of the Mandalorian Creed. Darth Maul was successful in besting the Mandalorian Death Watch leader Pre Vizsla in combat. However, this sparked another civil war in the Mandalorians, one that would last to the very end of the Clone Wars, where the Mandalorians, loyal to Pre Vizsla and weary of outside influence, sided with Bo-Katan, a top lieutenant of Pre Vizsla, while many sided with Darth Maul, as he was the rightful owner of the Darksaber, having won it successfully from Pre Vizsla. Duchess Satine Kreese was killed in the crossfire by Darth Maul, and Obi-Wan Kenobi, with the help of of Bo-Katan managed to escape the Mandalorian capital and rendezvous back with the Republic. But the hope that Obi-Wan Kenobi promised Bo-Katan never came, and the Republic never intervened into the Mandalorian affair until late in the Clone Wars. Bo-Katan, tired of having to deal with the waiting of Obi-Wan Kenobi's failed promise, enlists the help of Ahsoka Tano, a Jedi outcast who'd been expelled from the Order and then left voluntarily. The two bring their case to the Jedi Generals Anakin Skywalker and again Obi-Wan Kenobi, who eventually, with much deliberating, send a token force of clone troopers fitted with jetpacks to aid the Mandalorians loyal to Bo-Katan. The campaign was quick, but an arduous and tumultuous and very costly campaign of the capital city of Mandalore. With Darth Maul eventually captured, Bo-Katan seizes control of the capital of Mandalore and indeed of the Mandalorian people. Shortly after this incredible victory, the Empire rises to power and enslaves the planet of Mandalore. Many Mandalorians chose to ally themselves with the new Galactic Empire, including the Saxon clan, with their leader Gar Saxon, a former member of Darth Maul's Mandalorian Death Watch. Where did you get it? From Maul. You won it from him in combat? Uh, not exactly. I... Then you have no claim to it. As years pass, an Imperial cadet from Mandalore, Sabine Wren, a member of the Vizsla clan, constructs a weapon known as the Duchess, named after Duchess Satine Kreez. This weapon would hone in on Beskar armor, the armor used by the Mandalorians, and would vaporize the wearer inside. Now, the Mandalorians were unable to actually take off this armor, not because of any supposed need to not show their face, but because the Mandalorian armors that each individual warrior wore were important to their family. Bo-Katan's armor had been in her family for three generations. Sabine Wren had also had armor in her, gen in her family for multiple generations. Eventually, though, with the help of Phoenix Squad and members of the Ghost Crew, the Rebel Alliance actually manages to ally themselves with the original Mandalorians who were originally loyal to Pre Vizsla, that is, members of the Death Watch. The Darksaber had managed to be taken from Darth Maul, though it was not won as was tradition, and when Sabine Wren came into contact with it, she trained with it. Initially offering the Saber to Bo-Katan to lead the Mandalorian clans, this was rejected by Bo-Katan. Sabine Wren's own mother said that if she did not win it in combat, it did not belong to her. The Saber was eventually stolen by Gar Saxon. As another Mandalorian civil war brewed and eventually broke out, Sabine Wren dueled using a friend's Ezra Bridger's lightsaber to take the Darksaber from Gar Saxon, claiming the title of Mandalore and ruler of the Mandalorian clans. 
However, eventually ceding that power to Bo-Katan. Bo-Katan reluctantly accepted the lightsaber as multiple clans pledged themselves to her. A unique occurrence as the lightsaber was not officially won from its previous occupant. Rather, it was simply ceded over to her. The Mandalorians continued to fight valiantly against the Empire, eventually destroying the Duchess and managing to score several key victories against the Galactic Empire. However, as the Galactic Civil War drew to a close, the Empire eventually attacked the planet with everything that they had. In the Night of a Thousand Tears, many Mandalorian warriors were slain by the Galactic Empire. These men were under the command of Imperial Moff Gideon, an Imperial Security Bureau agent and governor of the region of the galaxy that Mandalore was present in. Though the means are unknown, he managed to get the Darksaber from Bo-Katan, though whether by combat or by simple thievery is yet unknown. Shortly after, all Mandalorian warriors abandoned the planet, many becoming mercenaries and traveling bounty hunters, like we see with the case of Din Djarin. Din Djarin, again, a member of the Children of the Watch, a religious zealot group, would not remove his helmet or armor. It is on one of his missions that he comes across a child of the same species as the legendary Grand Master of the Jedi Order, Yoda. He is eventually tasked by the armorer of his sect of the Mandalorians to track down a Jedi who may train him, citing that the Jedi are an ancient enemy of the Mandalorians. Superstition amongst the Mandalorians was heavy, as they did believe that a Darksaber incited the right to rule. So, when they regarded the Jedi, they were regarded as enemy sorcerers and a vile enemy that they needed to be weary of. A stark contrast to the immediate aftermath of the Mandalorian Jedi War of nearly 4,000 years earlier. On his journeys, he ran into many people either claiming to be Mandalorians or not Mandalorians of the same sect, including on Tatooine where he found a marshal of a town, as well as Bo-Katan and two other Mandalorians, likely of the sect Death Watch, which informed him of the fact that his group, the Children of the Watch, was a religious cult. However, Bo-Katan did manage to point Din Djarin in the way of Ahsoka Tano. The Mandalorian Din Djarin does eventually come into contact with Moff Gideon, eventually rescuing the child and managing to deliver him safely to a Jedi known as Ahsoka Tano. Ahsoka, who had had many run-ins with the Mandalorians, both good and bad, managed to help Din Djarin and the foundling Grogu, saying that it was required they go to an ancient Jedi temple, upon which... The foundling Boba Fett was found without his armor. Boba Fett aided Din Djarin in locating and rescuing the child from Moff Gideon, along with the aid of Bo-Katan and other Death Watch members. Bo-Katan, wanting to reclaim the title of Mandalore which she had held years ago, sought out the Darksaber from Moff Gideon. However, when she was as close as she could ever get, thus far at least, Din Djarin managed to defeat Moff Gideon, reclaiming the Darksaber into the Mandalorian Creed, but not for Bo-Katan, this time for himself. While the influences and necessary understandings needed for why Bo-Katan did not accept the Darksaber when she did much earlier when she hadn't won it in, com in combat are confusing and not necessarily clear, as real historical evidence has not yet been provided. Yet, it is my belief that she did not accept the lightsaber this time because she had accepted the lightsaber before. When she had accepted the darksaber from S Sabine Wren, Mandalore fell to ruin, fell to the Empire, and to civil war. Therefore, it is my belief that Bo-Katan wanted to earn the lightsaber this time, defeating Moff Gideon on her own rather than simply being given the darksaber. But as of right now, Din Djarin, a child of the Watch, is now in possession of the Mandalorian Darksaber, and thus he is, according to Mandalorian lore, the ruler of the planet Mandalore and of all Mandalorian clans.
In the several decades that follow this event, not much is known about the Mandalorians other than in the final battle of the Resistance First Order War on Exegol, several Mandalorian crafts of various make were present in the battle in the ranks of the Galaxy Fleet. This concludes the entire history of the Mandalorians. While this easily could have been much longer had I delved into the Legends timeline, I tried to avoid it as much as possible. All the information that you have seen here today is either present directly in canon or referenced heavily enough to where certain Legends elements may be pulled from them. Are you excited for future installations in the Mandalorian timeline? Are you excited for Mandalorian Season 3? Or perhaps the Book of Boba Fett? Or simply to learn more about this mysterious and incredibly interesting creed in the Star Wars galaxy? Be sure to leave your thoughts below and let me know. Thanks for watching, and as always, I'll see you again next time.